Good morning. Today is November 9th, and we'll start with a daily reflection on the Old Testament. All right. Who is this that cometh with dyed garments? Therefore thou art red in thine apparel, and thy garments, like him that treadeth in the wine fat, I have trodden the winepress alone. Isaiah 63, 1 and 3. Red is symbolic of victory, victory over the devil, death, hell, and endless torment. It is the symbol of salvation, of being placed beyond the power of all one's enemies. Christ's red apparel symbolizes both aspects of his ministry, his mercy, and his justice. Because he has trodden the winepress alone. He has descended below all things and mercifully taken upon him our stains. In addition, he comes in dyed garments as the God of justice. Even he who has trampled the wicked beneath his feet. And the Lord shall be red in his apparel and his garments like him that treadeth the wine vat. And his voice shall be heard. I have brought judgment upon all people. And I did tread upon them in mine anger, and their blood have I sprinkled upon my garments, and stained all my raiment. For this was the day of vengeance, which was in my heart. And that's DNC 133, 48 through 51. Okay. Um, so today is Hosea 5 and 6. And... I should have been more focused on getting context, but it just seems like it's the same kind of situation from one and two and three and four about how it's just all symbolic, how Israel is wicked, how they go after idolatry, um, how they need to repent and return. That, that seems to be the continuing theme here. Um, in five, the kingdoms of Judah and Israel will both fall because of their iniquities. And then six, Hosea calls Israel to return and serve the Lord. The mercies and knowledge of God are more important than ritualistic sacrifices. Mm. So once again, nothing really stood out to me. Um, let's see. Okay, so we've got very little here for uh, five and six. So chapter five, verses three and five, the terms Ephraim and Israel are used rather consistently in these chapters to refer to the northern kingdom of Israel, whereas Judah refers to the southern kingdom of Judah. Okay. And then chapter six, verse six. Um, for I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Sacrifice and burnt offerings are simply outward symbols of more important things. The Lord prefers mercy and a knowledge of him over the performance of the rituals. Um, so it's, well, we all know this, because in the New Testament, uh, Jesus says that the old is done away with, and here's the new law, you know, instead of, burn offerings, you're supposed to offer a broken heart and a contrite spirit. See, it's the higher law. Um, but some people want to continue with the lesser law because it's easier. It's easier to offer uh, uh, unblemished lamb once a month than it is to pay tithing every time you get money or to fast every fast Sunday, or to do your visiting, teaching, or ministering, whatever. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's what's being said here. And then for seven, six, chapter six, verse seven, but they, like men, have transgressed the covenant, there have they dealt treacher treacherously against me. The Hebrew word Adam can also mean man. In the context of this verse, the proper name of the first man, Adam, probably should have been translated man rather than men. 
but they like man, or Adam, have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. Okay. So that's... <clears throat> that's that. Um, I guess... I mean, this video is so short, but I guess I could... Uh, anyway, um, I made this this junk journal type thing for the Old Testament before we began. I made it last Christmas? No, I, I did it during Thanksgiving, I think. Anyways, I put it in the consignment shop. Nobody bought it, so I took it home. Um, but in it, it has a breakdown of the uh, chapters. Uh, where are we? Ecclesiastes, Isaiah. I mean, this was a cool journal. I probably should have used it instead of Obadiah. Have we been there yet? Nope. Amos? Nope. Joel? Hosea. Okay. God told Hosea to marry a woman who would never be faithful because the marriage is like God and Israel. Hosea obeyed God and married a woman who would not be faithful to him. He thus was able to prophesy with great passion about how God felt about all Israel's unfaithfulness. I guess that would give you a sense of like hurt and anguish if if you it's really sad that you knew she wasn't going to be faithful to you when she married you. And then um I mean that's that's a sad reality. It really is. The book contains warnings of the coming Assyrian invasion on the northern kingdom and the Babylonian invasion on the southern kingdom. The northern invasion was right around the corner, occurring in 722 BC. The invasion of the southern kingdom by the Babylonians would happen 150 years later. Nobody listened to Hosea. So here's a breakdown of the chapters. Um, chapter 1 and 2 is background. Hosea's wife and children, and Israel's sins and God's promises. In 3 and 4, Hosea told to reconcile with his wife and God's charge against Israel. And then 5, God's judgment against his people. And then 6 and 7, Israel refuses to repent. Chapter 8, judgment and sins described. 9 and 10, Israel, other nations, and great crimes. 11 and 12, God's love in spite of sin. And then 13, final charges. 14, a final call to repentance. And then it says, number of chapters, 14. What kind of chapter is it? Prophecy minor. Date written, 750 to 710 BC. Period covered, 750 BC to 6 BC. And uh, Jose is the author. So anyways, that probably would have been helpful at the beginning. So anyways, um... Yeah, it's really sad because it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful and nobody bought it. Nobody wanted it. I should have used it from the very beginning because it's quite beautiful and it's got space for for writing. Oh well, what are you going to do? Make another one for next year. Alright, so that was Hosea 5 and 6 and tomorrow we skip to 10 and 11. I will now leave you with a prayer from a diary of prayer. <clears throat> and today's the ninth. Oh, geez, this one is really long. I probably should have skipped that other stuff. It is a Jewish prayer. It's a memorial prayer. O Lord, our God, through whose love we have our being and in whose presence is eternal life, in this solemn hour we remember before thee all those lives in this world claim our love and affection, admiration, respect, and gratitude, and whom thou hast now taken to eternity. We recall the great of mankind who, in single measure, have pointed the way as leaders of men and nations. We think of the heroes and martyrs, especially of the house of Israel, but also of all the families of the earth, the witnesses to thy Holy Spirit in the world, may their names shine as the stars in heaven forever and ever. O oh, our merciful Father, we recall before thee, each one of us, those who are nearest and dearest to us, 
in the holy quiet of thy sanctuary. The names and the qualities of them all are counted over with tender longing. Each capacity, each merit, and each grace shines before us now as a crown to a treasured name and as an incentive to rich and noble living. May the voice of reason speak to our troubled spirits of the essential place of death in the scheme of life. We could know no life of meaning and worth except through the pilgrimage of struggle, which is the earthly lot of us all. May the light of faith pierce the shadows that enfold us and still the storm of our rebellion. May we be a little more content con May we be a little more content when our questions are not answered. May we be wise enough to sense the overmastering mystery which no human mind can penetrate. In God's holy presence, we would subdue arrogance and resign ourselves to a higher will. In the dwelling place of everlasting love, may we seek our rest and our comfort in the faith that all souls, theirs and ours, are bound up in the bundle of life. All right, so we'll see you tomorrow. Bye.